So as I said, I'm I'm, I'm Benjamin Epkins. So I'll um I'll introduce the topic uh, of today. I'll try to set up the context so that you understand what we mean by pharmacogenics. It has actually multiple definitions in the field. I really want you to interrupt me when you have a question. I think it's better that way so you stay on the topic. Uh, I'll pose to let you opportunities, but don't be shy. Just, just ask. Uh, there are no stupid questions, only stupid answers. So it's on me. There we go. Okay, so by the end of the day, I want, I, I hope um, you will have a better understanding of the role of biomarkers. Um, we are going to focus quite a bit on cancer, but those concepts are fairly generalizable, right? Uh, so if you're working on asthma or the diseases, it doesn't really matter, but cancer is definitely a complex disease. So um, uh, we are focused on precision oncology as a way to exemplify a little bit uh, our, our discussion here. We'll present different data types that we use to profile those cells. Again, cancer cells, but it could be any, any kind of disease cells. Um, and I would like to focus on the challenges that we face. It's an open field. It's not a done. It's not a. Uh, we don't have all the answers. So maybe it's gonna give you some um, ideas of what what to pursue next. Okay. So in the what what are bar, how do biomarkers are how how do biomarkers are used in um, in precision oncology? So. Usually what happens is that patient comes to the clinic and they look the same from a clinical perspective. Like you, let's say patient with the same age, the same kind of cancer type, maybe the same stage, they may still react to the drug very, very differently. Some people will benefit from the drug, some will not. And obviously that's because their tumor might be very, very unique even. So clinically speaking, those patients are very similar. The tumors might be very, very different. And so what we do, not that we have those very fancy sequencing technologies, among others, um, we can generate tons and tons of data what make that tumor and that patient really unique and try to understand the vulnerabilities of, of that tumor. And so we generate what we call those kind of big molecular data. And then based on that information, the hope is that if you have good biomarkers or good predictors of drug response, you can basically predict if a patient is going to respond favorably to a drug or not. And then depending on that, you can choose which drug you want to use or which trials this patient should be assigned to. But what is really a biomarker? You can think of it of anything you can measure in the patient. Age is a biomarker if you really want to go that way. But a gene expression or a mutation is also a biomarker. So anything you can measure quantitatively, so you can assess its, its stability, robustness, variance, uh, can be used as a biomarker. And we don't take one measurement, especially with those molecular big data, we take a lot of measurements. So those biomarkers don't need to be a single feature. They can be many, many features. So um, pharmacogenomics is, so th there is this concept of pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. And, and the simple way to discriminate them is that pharmacogenetics is really about single gene. If you have a mutation in a, in a gene and it's a Mendelian disease, Sometimes a single gene can define whether you will uh, suffer from that disease or you're likely to develop to develop that disease. Pharmacogenomics takes a broader approach. It's basically looking at all the genes, all you can measure, really. So more than one genes. And it's you look looking at not only multiple genes, but also the interaction. So it's much, much broader and it's been enabled by all those fancy technologies that we know today. And why this is important? Again, this is cancer, but I think this is generalizable to many other diseases. So we invest a lot of money in sequencing patients to try to understand their specific vulnerabilities. And the idea is that if we understand that, we can give them a specific treatment that we think are going to be very beneficial. And so here, let's take the example of clinical trials. So uh, an institute has multiple clinical trials ongoing. They investigate multiple drugs. And so you have a patient come in, you do the profiling, you find you have a biomarker, you find a vulnerability and say, oh, we're going to assign you to clinical trial X. That's if everything goes well. But in practice, what happened is that if you look in blue, dark blue are the patients that were actually matched. We found a biomarker, we found a trial. The light blue is we found a biomarker, but there was no active trial. So we could not match the patient to a trial, but we could have if we had the trial going. And the red, which is the most important part here, is that those are patients where we didn't find anything. Or we find stuff, 
we find signal or aberrations, but we didn't know what they mean. So they were not bar markers per se, they were not actionable. And so what's really puzzling is that we invest a lot of research and funding on building those bar markers and those trials, those, those new drugs. But the reality of precision oncology is that less than 50% of the patients actually do benefit from this approach, right? So there is definitely a kind of a lack of return on investment. Ideally, each patient should be able to benefit from, from this approach. So why, why is that? Sometimes you have an actionable bar markers, but you don't have access to the drug. Maybe the drug is not approved yet or it's not uh, reimbursed. Uh, so it's not really feasible to give it to the patient. Or maybe you don't have enough active clinical trials. So it's kind of a missed opportunity. Um, usually in the clinic, because we do things at, at scale and because we have to have very, very robust assays, those sequencing panels are usually very small. They do like 50 to 500 genes, maybe a thousand now. But as you know, we have way more genes and, and many, many different features. So those panels might be too small to discover what we really need to see. Um, and usually those biomarkers are limited to a single assay, either it's DNA or RNA or methylation, but we don't really have kind of this exhaustive profiling of, of tumors today. But I think what the most important bottleneck is, is the fact that sometimes we, we see mutations and copy number variations and other aberrations, but we don't know what they mean. So you can profile as much as you want. If you don't know how to act upon that knowledge, it's kind of useless from a patient perspective. And so there are very few of those biomarkers. Here I call them gene drug associations, which is a, a, another term. Um, and if you look at OncoKB, which is this database of clinically approved biomarkers, you can see that there are only 79 genes that have been associated, uh, that has been associated at, or, or identified as a biomarker for 135 drugs, but that's only 79 genes among 26,000 protein coding genes. And I'm not even talking about all the other non-coding genes. And it's only a hundred or so drugs compared to the thousand or maybe two thousands now of drugs that exist to treat cancer. So you can see that we barely, we barely scratch the surface. We use a lot of drugs and we don't know, we don't have any biomarkers for them, right? So some patient will not benefit and, and we won't be able to predict. And we barely explored the, the, the genome in terms of, of biomarkers. So for me, that's really, it's calling for the need of new biomarkers. Sure, you can have more drugs and more trials, but the reality is if you don't have those biomarkers, those drugs and trials won't be very efficient. And so here's a very, very simplified way, a simplified pipeline for biomarker discovery. So bear with me, it's oversimplistic, but it, it kind of set the ground for the rest of the discussion. So usually you start with the medical record of the patient. Um, so usually those are clinical data, lab tests, and what, what you generate in the clinic. And then you, you take a biopsy, and there are multiple forms of biopsy. It could be liquid biopsy, it could be blood, it could be a piece of tumor, it could be urine, it could be many things, many things. But you take a piece of tissue or, 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 or bio, biological samples that you can, where you can measure those biomarkers. Right, so I call it biopsy here for as a general term. Then you do the profiling. You try to understand what, what's in there, what are the, the features. Then there is data processing. So you really have to kind of understand the quality of the data. You have to process the data in a way that they are analysis ready. Uh, I don't know if you ever, I mean, you don't really do deep learning on a fast queue directly. I mean, so, so very few people do, but usually you transform that fast queue into a matrix of numbers that represent something that you hope is very informative, and then you do the analysis. So there is this data processing part. Then you do the predictive modeling. And we'll see, you can go very simple, like a single feature or linear regression model. You can go crazy, super complex deep learning network. It doesn't really matter, but you, you do a lot of predictive modeling. And then you have to evaluate the performance. And usually what people do is they, they take existing data. So it's called retrospective validation because they take data that have been generated in the past and they try to see whether that biomarker is indeed predictive in that independent data set, retrospective data set. But the ultimate evaluation is prospective. You have your biomarker and you have new patients coming in and you test whether you can make useful predictions. It's very, very costly, and it's a very, you know, the phrase is it's hard to predict, especially the future. 
that's exactly what happens in machine learning is that we're very good at predicting the past because we somehow overfit implicitly or explicitly, but the future, you have no way to really cheat, right? So uh, prospective validation is really the ultimate standard, but you can imagine in clinical setting, uh, recruiting patients, taking the samples, doing the profiling, uh, it has a lot of ethical and logistical uh, um, complexity associated to it. So as a machine learner, that's something that I wish one day I could say one of my biomarkers were prospective valid prospectively validated, but it's, it's actually very rare. So let, let's discuss a little bit what kind of biological materials you could, do, you could use for, for those pharmacogenics analysis. So on one side, you have the patient. I guess most of you, and, and by patient, if your patient is a yeast, that's fine, right? But you have like your target uh, population, if you wish. So you have your patient, and that's what you wanna, you wanna kind of build a biomarker for that specific entity. Um, the problem in oncology is that patient data is actually, as I said, very, very costly to, to generate. Uh, you have to uh, do, do things in the clinic, interact with the patient. So usually those data are very, very small but they're very relevant for you because that's exactly the population you want to target. But then if you go to the lab, uh, you can actually take a piece of tumor and, and clone it. And you have those immortalized cancer cell lines and you have organoids and you have patient-derived xenografts and most models. Are, there is a whole plethora of model systems where you can literally clone that tumor and attack that tumor in so many different ways. You have those perturbations so you can probe, understand what's going on, you can perturb which obviously you cannot do in the patient. You cannot clone a patient and test random drugs, right? So in the lab, you can do a lot of things that you cannot do in the clinic. So the scale of data you can generate in the lab is like orders of magnitude higher than what you do in the clinic. But as I'm sure you know, every time you take something from an in vivo system and you put it in the lab, you change things. It's not exactly like it were before. And so, if you look at the immortalized cancer sunlight, for instance, they've drifted, they've mutated over time. They grow in that dish with very rich nutrient. It doesn't really reflect what happens in the patient tumor. So even if you find a drug in a biomarker that works in the sunlight, you really, you're really not sure whether it's going to actually work in the patient. So there is this gap. So you get a lot of data on one side and the ability to probe and perturb, but on, but, but it, it it, it is somewhat irrelevant to some extent. And then you have the patient super relevant, but very, very small scale. So a lot of people hate immortalized cell lines. They have heard those horror stories about contamination and all oh, my colorectal cell lines actually heal our cell because HeLa is like the most fast growing, fastly growing uh, cell line. And, and you get this bacterial contamination and, and and those immortalized cell lines have drifted genetically. They don't look like the original tumor anymore. Like there's so many reasons why, they, why people hate them. But the reality is most of the biomarkers we use today in oncology have been discovered in cell lines. So they're not perfect, but they're not useless. And here's kind of a case for them. Um, you can, as I said, you can investigate. It's, it's very easy, relatively easy to grow cell lines. So you can do like, you can have big robots that basically treat those cell lines with a lot of different drugs, a lot of different genetic perturbations, and aggregate massive amount of data, right? So you can really go at scale. There is no ethical issues. You can actually even more simply share that data with your colleague in the scientific community because you can buy those cell lines, right? It's not like it's super sensitive material. If you take a piece of tumor from a patient, freshly derived, that patient might still be alive. Like there is a lot more sensitivity around the sequencing data you generate there. But the problem is that they're very simple models growing in vitro. They don't really reflect what happened in the clinic. The clinic. But here's the case for the using science and pharmacogenomics, especially if you develop a new method. So if you have this new method that can discover biomarkers, let's say you have a deep neural, deep neural network that predicts response to drug X. If it doesn't work in the cell lines, you're gonna have a very hard time to convince anybody that it's gonna work in the patient. Cell lines are, are this kind of, sandbox you can use to prove that your approach makes sense. So in a way, biomarker discovery in cell lines is a good first step. It's not the last one, but it's a good first step. Um, as I said, we can do a lot of chemical perturbation, genetic perturbation. We can actually mutate specific genes using CRISPR technology, for instance. Uh, and that's very useful to understand how the cells behave when you start removing genes or inhibiting specific proteins. 
Uh, but as I said, because they're so different, you always have to keep in mind the clinical validation. So when we do in the lab, what we do in the lab, we use those cell lines, but then we call them candidate biomarkers. They're not, they're not even real biomarkers yet. They're just, they're just hypotheses, if you wish. I know you're going to have to find either a more complex model, such as patient-derived xenograft or organoids, and even better, maybe some patient data where you can really test whether it's predictive or not. And so what, what a lot of people do to discover biomarkers is that they go from the cell lines where you have a lot of data, then they, they find those candidate biomarkers. They validate them, in, validate them into more complex model systems than the validated in the patient. So this is how I would say a, a, a pharmacogenics data set looks like. So first of all, uh, preclinical. Um, I should have the same slide for, for, for clinical trials, but if, for clinical trials, basically what happens is that you enroll the patient, you take the, the clinical information, piece of tumor, you profile, you store that information, you treat with the drug, and then you monitor response using radiology. We'll, sh we'll show you a, a little bit later on. And then you collect that information. That's your pharmacogenomics data set. In the lab, you do something like this. You have a collection of model systems, could be cell lines or granules, uh, mouse models. And then you first look at the response to a perturbation. So it could be radiation, could be drugs. So today we are focusing on drugs, pharmacogenomics. And then you look at these drug dose response curves. I'll, I'll show you a little bit later what, what it looks like. But anyway, you, you get a sense of how that cancer cell reacts to that drug. Is it dying? Is it surviving? Then on the other side, you, you basically have to provide that cell line with the technologies of interest. And the beauty is that cell lines, they grow. So you have a lot of materials, actually infinite amount of materials, if you want to think it that way. And so people have done everything. So now, Cell lines are not the most stable. They evolve over time. So if you grab a gene expression profile of a cell line that had been done 10 years ago, and you have this, the same cell line growing in your lab, you're not completely sure that if you redo the gene expression today, it's going to be exactly the same. But, you know, that's the assumption we make with cell lines that they're stable enough to basically be able to reuse data from all over the place. But there have been papers showing that um, if you do DNA sequencing, you're going to see more and more mutations as, as depending on the, how much, how long those cell lines grow in the lab. So you, you have to be a little bit careful, but we have tons and tons of those data published in the literature, including multiple studies who provide the same cell lines. So you can actually study the variation there. And when you merge this X, this input feature and Y, then that's where you basically build this biomarker. I call it F of X. It's just a function of the input. It could be a very simple linear function. It could be a deep neural network. We, if you want to take a, a, a very general term, it's called narrow AI, meaning it's artificial intelligence it's using machine learning, but for a very specific task. So your biomarker is not going to take over the world and kill mankind. You're safe. It's very, very, very narrow. Okay. So in terms of the function uh, f of x, um, it could be very simple, it could be univariable. And that's what most of biomarkers are. You identify that, that amplification, that gene fusion, that um, mutation, that gene expression that is predictive of response to drug X. Um, but in a way we kind of, I think we've, we've probably identified most of those. And so now people are really thinking about, we know biology is very complex. So we know multiple pathways, multiple genes, multiple proteins are involved. Um, so we need to go multivariable. So you need to build a model with multiple genes, or multiple features, and, and to model the interactions. And that's going to be a way to predict response. And you can do simple interactions, like linear interaction, like a linear regression model. Or you can go much more complex. As I said, it could, could be super vector machine, deep neural network, anything that is non-linear. And then what, what is kind of the forefront of biomarker discovery today, or pharmacogenics today, is really multimodal. It's like, why would you focus only on DNA, or only on RNA, or only on methylation? You could basically, or, or radiology or pathology, you can literally use multiple of those data modalities to kind of build a better multivariable model. But it's more than multivariable, it's multimodal and multivariable. So that's, you can see the increase in complexity. And so in the lab, we always start simple. Why don't you look first at single features? Because if one single feature is very predictive, you're kind of done. You don't really need 
a very complex multivariable model just to get that 1% increased predictive value, which by the way, will probably never validate prospectively. You know, you think you're doing better in your training set, but in reality, your model is so complex, it will probably fall apart in the real world. So sim Occam's razor, simple is better. And here's a good, we always start from uh, the left to the, uh, to, yeah, from the right to the left. Or oh, whatever, left to the right. Easy to, to more complex. And so in terms of um, the phenotype, how those cells respond to, um, to the drug, if you look at immortalized cancer cell lines, so those are what we call in vitro data. So you have cells growing in a dish, you uh, treat them with a drug, and basically you increase that concentration of the drug progressively, that's the x-axis, and you look at cell viability, that's the y-axis. And so basically the y-axis is telling you, is the cell viable? or does it die? And the x-axis is like, what happens when I increase that concentration? And so from a pharmacological perspective, you don't want something that's very potent, like bleach would kill everything right away, but that's not gonna be a drug. And I won't comment on drugs advice on COVID, but you, you, want, you want to have that kind of nice curve where you can modulate the effect of the drug, how strong the response is by concentration. Otherwise, it's going to be a very, could be potentially a very dangerous drug, right? Um, but we love that very nice sigmoid. And, and Ligta might be laughing because in reality, it's usually more complex than the sigmoid. So you basically, at the beginning, by definition, the, the viability is 100%. You get zero concentration of the drug, the cell is happy. That's your control, that's your reference. Then you increase and then it, it basically the viability decreases accordingly. And then there are a few statistics that pharmacologists really, really like. Uh, the IC50, that's the concentration you need to kill 50% of the cells in absolute terms. Um, then the Emax is how much cells you can kill with like the max concentration of the drug. Because some drugs you can you can add more, but it doesn't kill more. So there is kind of sometimes a limit on how a drug can kill the cells. There might be pocket of cells that are either resistant or they create a mechanism to, to, to basically stop dying. That's the Emax. The EC50 is that middle point between the Emax and the, and the reference. And then what uh, a matrix that we use a lot in the lab is called the area under or above the drug dose response curve. And why we like it is because if you redo the experiment multiple times, the AAC seems to be more stable. The IC50 is a bit finicky, like sometimes noise in the experiment could really change by an order of magnitude your IC50 or EC50. Um, but bottom line is, this is a relatively complex curve. And we like, in machine learning, we like to summarize everything in one number, because we like to predict that number. But that's not the reality. And you can even argue that vi viability is actually a very crude phenotype of response. Sometimes just stopping the cell proliferation is fine. They're still alive. Oops. No Oops. They're still alive, but they cannot um, they cannot uh, proliferate. Maybe that's what you need in terms of therapeutic effect. Or you stop invasion so they cannot metastasize. Those assays are really crude. They just look at cell viability. But now people are really starting to think like the phenotype is multidimensional. How can we measure in a high throughput way multiple aspects? But for today, we'll focus on cell viability. It's an easy way. And we're going to focus on that single number that tells you roughly if that cell is sensitive or resistant to our drug. But keep in mind, like this is an oversimplification of the actual biology going on. So in mouse models, it's a little bit, or in vivo models, it's a little bit different. Um, you basically have the x-axis is time now, so that concentration is time, and the y-axis is tumor growth, tumor volume if you wish. And so, and, and here we usually use what we call the maximum tolerated dose. So we, we give like one dose of, of, of the drug to that animal or, or patient and, and see what happens. And the reason we can really test many, many drug concentrations that um, in the patient is impossible for sure. Um, but in the, um, in the mouse model, it's very, very costly. Those experiments are very, very slow and, and we have ethical uh, responsibility to use those uh, live animals very, uh, very uh, in a very parsimonious way. So we basically people select one drug where they think there is a strong effect and it's well tolerated by the animal. So you don't have toxicity. And then you see if 
the control is like this wet curve. It's like the tumor is growing very fast, unperturbed. And the blue curve is basically uh, the drug treatment. And that's obviously a perfect case where you see that that drug is controlling uh, the growth of the tumor perfectly. Actually, not even controlling, it's shrinking the tumor uh, to almost zero, right? So that you'll never see a curve like that or very rarely uh, in, in, real, uh, in real experiment. And so people have tried to, you know, remember, we like to summarize those curves into single numbers to do machine learning, right? So people have thought about how can we summarize that drug response? And so people use something called um, modified resist. So in the clinic, the resist evaluation is really um, looking at multiple lesions in the, in the patient using radiology to look at their diameter or volume and basically see whether those tumor grows or shrink. That's kind of how, what, how we do it in the clinic. In the animals, we basically either pinch the tumor or even if you have a lot of money, you can do radiology as well. And then you look at this tumor growth, but it's usually single lesions. And then you have four categories. If the tumor completely disappear, we call it complete response. If the tumor um, uh, shrink by 30%, so it doesn't disappear, but it shrinks, we call it partial response. If it's stable, meaning that it, it grows or, or shrinks less than 30%, we call it stable disease. And if it grows more than 30%, we call it progressive disease. Right? So we basically took that kind of continuous drug response and, and bin it into categories, just to make it simple. Um, but you can also compute the area between the control and uh, the, the response, uh, the drug curve. And that would also give you an indication. If there is a big area between the two, it means that the drug has a lot of effect. So, but again, same that, similarly to cell lines, it's a very crude way to summarize everything that's going on in, in, in the animal. But we kind of need it to, that's our objective. When you do biomarker, you want to predict something. And that's, that's the something is either those four categories or this continuous area between the curves. So in terms of profiling, um, you can do a lot of things. So you have clinical data, as I already mentioned. Even if you if you consider a patient drug Xenograph, where they take a piece of tumor and grow it in a mouse, in a mouse um, this tumor comes from a patient. So you have age, sex, um, stage of the disease, like all those parameters are actually relevant for that mouse model now, right? So you have the clinical data, then you have the omics, genomics, methylation, et cetera. And then you have the imaging radiology pathology the beauty with radiology is that it's non-invasive but the resolution is very poor you're not going to see like single gene mutation on radiology i wish we could but today we cannot pathology is kind of this crude image but it's invasive you have to take a piece of tumor but it gives you this nice spatial organization of the of the of the tumor and the, the tumor microenvironment so much richer than radiology but not that fancy and then you have all the genomics really deeping like super high resolution on potentially every single cell um, in, in the tumor. So really going from low resolution, but non-invasive to high resolution with invasive and expensive. But what I found fascinating is that there is this trend and it's probably always been there, but now that we have big data, it's even more obvious. You know that assays like single cell rna seq and spatial transcriptomics, for instance, very fancy technology, super informative, but they're probably not going to be in the clinic for the next 20 years. Super expensive. You need high quality samples, which is hard to, to get from a surgical room. Um, so at the end of the day, they're great for biomarker discovery, but this is not the kind of biomarker you'll be able to use in the clinic. So what very smart people did is to say, okay, can we learn a signal from those fancy technologies and see whether we can translate that signal into a technology that we do use do use in the clinic. I'll give you an example. If you if you do radiology, it's non-invasive. It's already used in the clinic, so you don't have to invent anything. It's already there, right? Can you imagine if you could predict from radiology if your tumor has an EGFR mutation or a KRAS mutation? Then you don't need sequencing anymore, right? Radiology might not be perfect. For instance, EGFR mutation could be predict predictable from radiology, but not KRAS. So not all mutations give rise to a phenotype you can detect from radiology. People have used pathology to basically predict every single individual gene expression 
from spatial transcriptomics. So they basically have the slide with pathology, the slide with spatial transcriptomics, and they basically ask a very stupid question. Can I, for a given spot, can I predict from just the image or the gene expression? You know it's impossible, right? That's why we invented spatial transcriptomics. But you can probably learn enough of that relationship so that you can detect with a, sig with a good accuracy whether there is, a, um, I don't know, a high angiogenesis gene expression signature. And suddenly you've learned something from the spatial transcriptomics and you build a pathology-based um, predictor. And now you can use it in virtually all the, clinic in the, all the clinics in the world, right? So there is this concept that you can use assays that are used in the research to basically build something that is clinically actionable. Maybe that's for another workshop, but I found this, this concept very, very exciting. So what kind of um, omics technologies do we have? So you probably know genomics. Uh, it's all about detecting mutation, copy number variation, gene infusion, structural rearrangements. Epigenomics, epigenomics, those are modifications of the DNA that are not um, the base pairs themselves. Uh, it could be methylation, the way the, the, the DNA is, is packed, so chromatin uh, accessibility. Transcriptomics, those are the messenger RNA, the non-coding RNA, uh, expressed gene fusions. Proteomics, it's all about the proteins and protein complex. Metabolomics, which is not my field, is, is really about all the, 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 the metabolomic pathways that happens in the cells and how they use their energy. And then you have more the phenotypes like chemistry and, 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 and genetic perturbation. So in terms of genomics, some example of our markers. Um, so you have, for uh, instance, BRCA1 or the BCR, ABL1 gene fusions, the ABBT amplification, all those things, all those DNA features have been associated with drug response. So when you go to the clinic, we measure this and see whether the drug associated to those biomarkers could be, could be beneficial for you. Uh, so here's an example of people who looked at all those DNA mutational signatures, so like UV damage and, and some even signatures that are associated with smoking, for instance. Uh, they actually do affect your cells. Uh, and so they, they said they, they were looking whether those kind of mutational signature was associated with drug response or the um, some other signatures for BRCA1 and, and BRCA2 deficiencies. So transcriptomics is a very kind of exciting source of biomarkers. Why? Because actually RNA-seq is now being used more and more in the clinic. So it's really something that if you find a good biomarkers, can you potentially translate it in, into the clinic. But right now, the signatures are very simple. So Oncotype DX is this linear regression model of 21 genes, but it is pretty good at predicting uh, chemotherapy response in breast cancer. And then you have a PCA3 um, expression in um, for prostate cancer. Um, and then you have very fancy ways to leverage your, your gene expression. And, and this topic is not about all those crazy models you could use. For uh, this workshop, it's not about all the crazy models, but here's an interesting one where you basically look at synthetic lethality. Like if those two genes are down at the same time, the tumor goes badly. And so basically, if you if in, in your cancer cell, one gene is already down, then you know that targeting the other genes is going to create these synthetic lethal interactions. And the, the cell is okay if one of those genes is expressed, but if they're both down, down expressed, not expressed anymore, then the cell dies. So, this, in this paper, they try to identify all those pairs to basically try to predict drug response that way. Kind of a fancy way to leverage uh, messenger RNA. So proteomics, we have also PSA for prostate cancer, uh, CA uh, for colon cancer. So those are proteomics biomarkers. They either predict survival of the patient or, or, or therapy response. And in terms of epigenomics, I know of only one clinically approved methylation biomarker is in the MGMT um, genes uh, for uh, its use in uh, glioblastoma, I believe, for the response to temozolomide. Um, I think the field of pronouncing drug names uh, is a very interesting field. I've not mastered that, um, that aspect. Maybe as a pharmacologist, you can teach me how to, to do that. Oh, yeah, I speak French as well. So we, we'll do a French uh, workshop on, on drug names. OK, so. Yeah, so it, uh, some attack some um, epigenomic signatures are really up and coming. We think that this is going to be a very good source of biomarker biomarkers, but it's not really something we do very often in the clinic. I think methylation we start doing it for brain cancer in the clinic, but it's still early days, so uh, it's still a, a pretty new field. 
Okay, so as I said, there are some complexity in the kind of, of data you can generate. So um, I really like radiological imaging because it's non-invasive. You can do it multiple time points. So you can really look at the progression of your biomarker, but it's very low resolution. Then you can go liquid biopsy. You can literally look at tumor cells in the blood. It's great, but it's kind of a summary of everything that's happening from a cancer perspective. If you have multiple metastases, sometimes people have two different primaries, a breast and a color colorectal cancer, for instance. It's just going to summarize it all in the blood. But again, very easy to get samples, pretty, it's called minimally invasive. And then tissue biopsy is like this more precise piece of, of tissue where you can know a lot of information about that specific lesion, but you can, as a patient, you don't want like 20 needles in your body. And sometimes taking the biopsy is very risky. Liver cancer, you actually spread the cancer cell lines or the cancer cells that way. So a biopsy would be very, very dangerous for you. So great data, but very, very hard to, to acquire and sometimes risky to get. Um, you didn't ask any questions, actually. I said I would pose, I didn't. So do you have uh, any, any questions so far? We're still going to have time at the end of the talk, but if you have any urgent questions, now is the time. James? Yeah, the, the beginning of the talk, the slide that you had a uh, problem sending out. Uh, was it, how is the YX order chronologically? I know it's clearly done in terms of like a waterfall of the percentages, but is that a part of fact of Availability, or are we seeing sort of a greater? Oh, I saw what you mean. Yeah, so if I can rephrase the question, it would would that be why different trials have yeah, why was different... that matched oh, at you know seventy five percent versus yeah. Vanderbilt was at twenty, and is that a function of protocol or you know in time? Yeah, so it's not related to time; it's a question of protocol. So it all it all it all depends what you consider an actionable biomarker. So if you have Let's say you find something that works in cell lines. As I said, in the lab, we don't even call them biomarkers. We call them candidate biomarkers because they have, we need a lot more evidence to make sure it works in the patient. But if you consider them as biomarkers, then suddenly we have millions of them. And then I can match any patient to anything, right? The quality of that will be extremely poor, but I have, I'm going to have 100% matching. So Vanderbilt had a pretty relaxed definition of what they consider an actionable biomarker. So they, they probably require less evidence to consider it as a valid biomarker. While others, like at Princess Market, we've been extremely conservative on what we consider our set of, of valid biomarkers. And so that, that explains that huge variation between the patient that we're able uh, to, be, to be matched that way. So that, that's a good question. And, and at some point, as a clinician, you sometimes you have no data whatsoever and you you're ready to kind of lower your evidence for your clinical treat uh, your treatment decision because a decision on no data is very uncomfortable a decision on weak data is a bit better still uncomfortable but a bit better right so it, even that definition may depend on the clinician the institution and the, the severity of the situation if that's your last chance they're probably going to use a biomarker from some lines because they're nothing really else to, to base their decision upon. Yeah. yeah, good question. So I actually defined, and my folks would know better, but they have like multiple levels of evidence, like one, two, three. And one is like clinically approved. It has been tested in patients multiple times uh, for specific indications. Um, it's been, a, yeah, it's been approved basically, but high level of evidence. Three is like, there was a paper on PubMed. There was a paper on PubMed for everything, right? So the very weak level of evidence. Um, and then two, I think it's like in multiple model system, like they, they, they have the definitions mm -hmm. on their website, but it's a very important point. Like it's a continuum, right? And, and sometimes it's approved in one cancer type, but it's never been tested in another cancer type. So in, in that sense, like this pan cancer, um, translatability of a biomarker is also a big question mark. Like what was the level of evidence? Uh, if, if you compare breast and ovarian, it may work because they're both hormone-driven cancers. But if you compare breast and lung cancer, 
uh, I don't think that biomarker is going to be translated successfully, right? So it's it's a rather complex manner, but they, they have this very nice kind of uh, scale for evidence. Anything else? Uh, any other questions? I'm almost at the end. So, um, okay. So here's um, how much time do I have? Oh, we still have time. Perfect. So that's really where I would like you to interrupt me. Um, we recently came up with what we call hallmarks of biomarkers or hallmarks of drug response models. And those are concepts that I would like you to keep in mind when you develop biomarkers. Um, and you can argue that those are good concepts or bad concepts, or maybe I'm missing one, or maybe you know I should merge multiples. But um, with Trey Edeker at, at University of California, San, California, San Diego, we kind of came up with that that scheme with with others. Um, so the first one is data type, and the idea is that we discussed that at length already. What kind of data type do you want to use for your biomarker discovery? Is it something that already exists in the clinic? Is it something that very expensive and very invasive that only very few patients can afford or, or even will do. So there is a lot of question, like maybe the samples, is it to be, does it have to be snap frozen right away after surgery? Can it be sit on the desk or can it be stored on FFP? What kind of assay, DNA mutation, whatnot? So you, you really have to think hard about the data types. We discussed that already. But from an ethical perspective, as I said, maybe some technologies are so expensive, only the rich people can afford it. And that's kind of not very nice. Right? If you can find a biomarker that is being is using radiology or pathology, then virtually all patients can benefit out of it. So there's this 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 uh, some some question about uh, access to those sensitive data and, and and what kind of assay you want to use that will impact the use of the biomarker. And as I said, we already discussed that, but research assays and clinical assays are very, very different. Research assays, you can go you can go crazy, basically. You, it can be very expensive, can be very, very high throughput, tons of features, can be very noisy. Maybe it's a prototype of a special transcriptomics technology, whatnot. But in the clinic, we need to be we need to make sure that those assays are very, very robust. So they have to be certified, right? So usually that's why they're so small, and that's why, because you need to control both the cost and the robustness. The second one, I, I think the data actionability, I'm, maybe you have a question about that, but I think that that has been covered already. Any, any questions about the first hallmark? That's, that was an easy one. This one is, is harder. Is how complex you need the model to be for your biomarkers, a single feature, a deep neural network. And so the architect, this hallmarks architecture is really basically trying to stipulate that you have to take an informed decision about how complex you want your drug response models to be. And so basically it's, it's just some sort of model capacity, how complex the relationship you can model from, from your data. And we know biology is crazy complicated, but we also know technologies are very noisy and the sample size is very small. So there is a limitation on how complex a computer can find, or how complex a pattern a computer can find, obviously. And so what we do in the lab, and I think it, it's not too controversial, but actually Jeffrey Hinton, the Nobel Prize, disagree with this. So it's kind of interesting. Maybe I should not disagree with the Nobel Prize winner, but you know, I disagree before it was a Nobel Prize winner, so maybe it, it counts. But um, I would favor simple architecture just because they're easier to implement. You're, you're less likely to overfit. Um, so it might be more generalizable. But actually, I had a conversation with, with Jeffrey Hinton, and he basically said, Actually, I think it's the opposite. I want a billion different complex models that all capture a piece of, of the true relationship and together they're going to be this fantastic predictor. So may, maybe it's true, but for now it has not been proven. And as I said, in the clinic, the simplest model are the ones that we use today. So. And then how well do you go with like a mindset of that's the kind of budget that people would have to use this biomarker signature or something. How much money they would put per patient? So, like, just just to have um, it has to be simple. Like, we don't want to have just one gene. And how much can we appreciate the efficiency that is visible? Very good question. So, a lot of people start thinking about their clinical assay first, 
And, and I'll give you an example. In the research, you can do RNA sequencing. So you have basically all the messenger RNA or all the non coding RNA. And then they find a signature and then they, they use nano strings, uh, uh, another technology that's much smaller scale, but cheaper, uh, certified for clinical use. And so they basically explore with one technology and they build an assay, a different clinical assay. So that's one approach. Um, a lot of researchers, unfortunately, don't really care. They just take whatever data and they want to publish like a method paper or or whatever and they say, oh, my model is doing so much better. But they don't even think a minute about how can those predictors be used in the clinic. So you have hundreds of papers, but the reality is that 99% of those papers don't even have the pretension to be translated into the clinic. So I feel like it's a bit of a, lo a lost opportunity. I think if more people were thinking about building stuff that could actually be used, the field would be quite different and maybe we would have a lot more biomarkers in the clinic today. But so good point, like thinking about the clinical use beforehand is very important to kind of narrow down not only the assay, but also the architecture because a lot of models such as DeepNet, they use all the features and you can try to prune it and make them more parsimonious or whatnot, but by almost by construction, they can handle that massive amount of data. But if 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 you don't care and you need all of those, then the translation technique is gonna be pretty tricky, right? Because you basically need this super deep assay to make your prediction. So that's an example where architecture matters. If I'm looking for single features, it's gonna be super easy to to, to translate in the clinic. And, and some models, um, like especially if you look at the large language models, or, or those are good examples, they take an insane amount of resources to train. And actually even the inference, just you have a model that's fully trained, make the prediction cost a lot of power. And when you build biomarkers, you have to think at scale. You know, there are like millions and millions of, of patients in the world so if your biomarker is to be successful, um, it could have a real ecological impact. Like if you have to use like big GPU farms to make your predictions or to train the model, not, not everybody can do that. And that's why for the moment, like the Google and the Microsoft and the open AI in the world, they lead the, the research because they, they're only, the only one with access to those massive computing power. But there are a lot of research to, to be done to kind of see how we can make those models simpler so that you don't need that much research. That many resources. I guess there's also as much as similarity you're using, but how are we? Because your script, everybody is seeing the bioinformatics quite quickly, and you got the answer in one second. I would say that's what you think you would get <laughs> when you don't do the scripting, but there is some of the script that takes forever to run. So the more complex, the more it will take time. And I don't know, you can have script that will run for so long that. Yeah. Uh, the answer very fast, right? For instance, sequencing, no, we've we've made it very efficient, but when you have to take a treatment decision within a couple of days because the patient is really in need, and it takes like a week to map your reads to the transcriptome, that's a problem, right? So that's an example where computational time for the prediction is actually a, a bottleneck. But uh, I think even for like uh, neural networks now, we can build those design chips that are really good at just making predictions. The problem is that if you modify the model, you have to modify the chip, so it's a bit trickier. Um, yeah, so so basically, that's what I, wa I was kind of alluding to this. What I found a bit frustrating in research is that we want to publish, so we want to make stuff that are fancy. But in the clinic, we do the opposite. Everything that's fancy is hard, so we tend to go simple. So there is this big disconnect between the researchers and the, the, the clinicians. So it's kind of kind of fun. But yeah, why do you want to publish a fancy method? It's more interesting. It's fun. It's going to be leveraged. My very expensive GP cluster I just bought. Uh, it's going to be easier to publish a fancy model than a linear one. But the reality is that a lot of those fancy models don't do significantly better than simple one if you do a proper validation. Which brings me to the third hallmark, which is benchmarking. You can always build models that look great on the training set. Just the model is just gonna memorize the data you show it. It's gonna work. It, it always works. You give it random data, it works too. If the model is sufficiently complex, it's gonna go crazy. But the reality is that if you don't evaluate the performance properly, 
it will never translate because the signal in the model, this will, this pattern that you think you have identified, is not real, right? So benchmarking is very important. Um, and by benchmarking here, I mean I call it within domain, meaning you train on some lines, validate on some lines. Should should be easy. So benchmarking is this first validation. Take the easy easy case. Um, and then you can compare with other models, and then you can look whether complexity really helps. And so, um, in the field, there've been a lot of um, a lot of bias because uh, you know if you're researchers, the way it works is that you're you're on a problem and you try and it fails, then you try again and it fails, and you do a thousand iterations and it works, and then you publish and you say, oh yeah, I tried this and it worked. You never say you tried a thousand other things that didn't work, right? So there is this kind of implicit overfitting here. You try and try and try. And a lot of people use that test set again and again and again. So if I want, you, want to be devil advocates here, I could say if you try random stuff a thousand times, maybe one, st one will stick. But it's random. It's not real, right? So there's this concept. In, it, we don't do that in clinical trials because patients' lives are at stake. A lot of money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So people have to pre-register the analysis. They basically say, "I'm going to do this, right, and nothing else." Which obviously in research is never going to work. Imagine you do your PhD and say, "I'm going to do this," and it fails. You're done. You know, look for a job. So nobody's going to do that in research. But we probably need a bit of a compromise, like a trade-off, where we limit our search, certainly when we use the test set. Um, and some actually journals are kind of embracing this. And you can basically, if you say, I'm going to do this, and it's being peer reviewed, and if they like your analysis design, they're going to publish your paper, whatever the results, which is very interesting, right? It, they basically publish, the, they want to publish their hypothesis. But then you don't have this pressure of giving that, getting that p value of 0 0.049, right? It's, it's all about the process of, of testing the hypothesis, which is what we should do in science. But, those, I mean, I guess this is not nature, cell, or science, right? Those are low impact journals that try to do this. Once nature, cell, and science do that, maybe it'll have a really uh, impact in the field. Um, but it's not a widespread practice because it's super limited. What I really like is, I don't know if you've ever participated to those challenges. So people basically say, here's the training data, and we have a test data that we're not going to show you. So there is no way for you to cheat. Then you, you kind of, compete friendly on pieces of data and, and people get all excited. Then, then at the end of the competition, they test on the on the on the independent data set and the winner get a prize, right? But the beauty is that you basically specified everything, the training set, the test set, the performance matrix, ranking criteria, baseline predictive models. The only thing you don't specify is which method. You can go crazy, right? But then the evaluation is very robust because you never saw those data. So you really it's like very, very kind of fair compared to the other competitors. So anyway, it's kind of a fun way to make benchmarking more robust. Sorry? Yes. How much you? Yes, but the algorithm that you set, it was lucky compared to the others. So today have a good strategy to the efficiency of the competition, I guess, but it's, if, if the algorithm that you have designed on the first um, data set, yeah. then he runs it, everybody runs their own algorithm at the end, and one has the better prediction. Is that because you want to look it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Good, you took you turned the argument my my previous arguments against myself. Yeah, that's a good one. So if you have a million participants, it could definitely happen. Multiple testing, like you just generate a million random models and one wins because there is always a winner, right? But maybe it's just pure random. Those competitions are usually like a, a few hundred students. So it, it it is an issue that people try to take into account, but it's definitely more robust than just you playing in the lab thousands of times until it works right? so but but you're right like the fact that you just throw a lot of modeling approaches to a problem makes it sensitive to that exact issue you mentioned um so generalizability is this kind of level two benchmarking if you wish is now you're really trying to predict for your target population so if you, let's say you use cell lines to find a biomarker 
ultimately you want to save the patients, right? So you know you're going to test it in a patient data set, a clinical trial or whatnot. And that, as, as we know, there is this big gap, like sunlight don't resemble the response in vivo, blah, 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 recapitulate what happens in vivo. So um, it's, it's, a, it's really uh, difficult to do, but it's very important from a ethical perspective, because if you don't do that, you may put patient at risk if your biomarker doesn't work. If it's random, it's okay, but they've been, it's, it's a bad story, but there have been a story where somebody cheated and they basically built mm -hmm. a biomarker that was not random, that was worth, it was harmful. It was predicting the other way. But because that person cheated in publication and changed labels and whatnot, so that, that actually it's the only case where I, I'm aware of, of patients suing a researcher because that researcher was doing harm. Usually if we're bad, we don't do harm, it's random, right? If we're good, we can help. But that was a case where there was harm. So it's kind of kind of interesting. But online, don't, don't cheat. Um, yeah, I won't go into the details here, but the, the bottom line is, if you have a biomarker that's being used in the clinic, you also have a responsibility to monitor its performance over time because the world is changing, because the cancers themselves are changing, the way you're exposed to chemicals, the way... Like for instance, HPV um, had an cancer may disappear because we have the vaccine. So the population of patients and the type of cancer are really changing. So you, you basically have to make sure that a biomarker that you used 10 years ago is still valid today, right? Or at least that the, maybe the predictive value changed. So that's gonna be kind of this longitudinal monitoring is, is, is kind of a hot topic. The problem is that we don't really have a lot of real world data to kind of study this. Um, but I think as we, especially as we deploy more AI models in the clinic, I think that's going to become uh, a very important line of research. Okay, so I should, I should wrap up. Um, this notion of fairness, we touched that on a little bit, um, but I know no paper, research papers at least, looking at the fairness of biomarkers. So let's say you find a biomarker that for surprising, worked only on male Caucasian, Caucasian males, okay? The reason is mostly because we have a lot of data for Caucasians and usually males are enriching a lot of, of those clinical and preclinical data sets. So great, your biomarker works there, but let's say you didn't know that it was mostly Caucasian males. So you basically tell the world, oh, I have this biomarker predictive of a drug response. The, the reality is it works in Caucasian males. So you may actually do maybe not harm, but maybe it has no predictive value in the other subset. So it's not fair, right? Now imagine that at the very least, one solution is to basically be aware of it, identify, identify that bias and basically say, this biomarker only works in that subset of the population. So at least you know when to use it. And if you do that, then you may realize that 90% of the biomarkers out, out there were for Caucasian. And then it would trigger new lines of research and saying, but what about um, African uh, 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 patient with African ancestry or Asian, you could or, or female, male, right? You could really focus more resources to make it fair. But right now, it's something that people barely look at, and it kind of backfires now because we have all these diverse populations, especially in Toronto, and we need to make sure that the technology we deploy those biomarkers are actually effective for a diverse set of patients. I don't know if you follow that story, but it could be also a technological bias. So for instance, the first version of the Apple Watch didn't work on dark skins. And so basically what happened is that Apple had to go back to the drawing board, modify the algorithm to make sure that the quality of heartbeat detection, for instance, or whatever they detect in the blood, was good in all subset of the population. But for a few months, Apple was under scrutiny, right? It was very bad with reputation, like it was damaging their reputation, so they had to go back. But that kind of biases are pervasive. They always happen. If you don't look for them, you never know. So it's kind of a new thing. None of the papers we've published in the lab in terms of our markets will ever look at this. So we are guilty as, as many others, but I think now it's something that you could pay attention. Any data set, any clinical or preclinical data set use is always biased toward a certain um, subset of the population because they were easier to access or they were the people with money, whatever the bias is, right? But you really have to identify those biases. Um, and actually, if you look at AI, 
in, in medicine, there have been multiple cases where people look back and say, oh, that technology is actually super biased. So there was this uh, surgical, like there was an AI assess scoring sur surgeons in the room by, by video. And depending whether you were in um, institution one or two, the, the AI was biased. Maybe because the camera was positioned differently or the quality was different, whatever, but the, uh, an institution got bad scores. So, but it's probably nothing to do with the surgeons themselves, right? So this kind of biases. Or there was a, a radiomics, radiology study where the model could identify rays. And they tried to prevent the model from doing this, and they could not. There was something in the images that would always bias the model. So um, kind, of, kind of interesting. Um, yeah, so it could be the bias could be in the data. It could be the way it's measured, like the Apple Watch uh, story. Or it could be the algorithm itself. Maybe you have this great data set, but for some reason, the algorithm focused on a subset of population where it's just easier to predict and, and ignore the rest. It could be just purely algorithmic. We're almost done. So hallmark six. Ideally, ideally you want your biomarkers to be something you understand. So for instance, ERBV2 amplification for air, uh, for um, ERBV2 inhibitor, clastuzumab or what? Oh, lapatinib, thank you. Um, the, the, the real brains on that side of the room. Mm -hmm. um, so ERBV2 amplification for lapatinib or trastuzumab, it makes sense because the drug is targeting ERBV2. If the gene is amplified, the cell is addicted to it, you can have a big three treatment effect, easy. That's where the biomarker is the drug target. And a lot of people always think that way, but a lot of drugs like um, 17-AG, I don't remember the, the, the brand name, um, is, targeting, uh, is targeting a gene, but the drug has to be metabolized by another protein. And so if you don't have that protein, the drug does nothing. So the biomarker is not the target, it's how you metabolize that, that drug. That's NQ1, that's the gene, the protein doing it, that's the biomarker. And those are simple examples, but now let's say you have a deep neural network and it does a prediction. You have no freaking clue what this thing is doing, right? If you're lucky, it is very predictive and you can use it, but you don't know what it does. And so you're gonna really get biological insights and so the problem becomes, do you need your model to be interpretable, to be useful in the clinic? Sure, clinicians will trust it more if they understand what's going on. And they will trust it less if it's a black box. But then I would say there are two scenarios. If your predictor is really, really good, it's been proven to be really good over time in multiple situations, maybe you can overcome that lack of interpretability because you can trust the technology. It's like your self-driving car or when you fly, um, the pilot relies a lot on technologies because uh, it works. It's been shown multiple times that it works. And the pilot doesn't know all the engineering going inside the autopilot for the plane or, or, or in the case of, of self-driving cars, what neural networks they use. But you know that in some situations, it's super safe to use. And others, you're like hands on the wheel and, and you, you basically want to take control. Um, but if a model can be interpretable, that's always better. Like if you if you have even a superficial understanding of what's going on, you're always gonna probably feel better about it, about using it, more confident, but also you may learn something about what's going on. Um, and so bottom line is, if you can afford to be interpretable without decreasing the performance too much, let's say you can do a linear regression model and it, it works as well as the deep, deep learning model, go with the linear regression because you know the interactions between the genes and the few genes that are being selected. Deep neural net is very opaque. Um, but yeah, the, the controversial point here is that clinicians think they know what they're doing. No clinicians in the room? Okay, it's, it's recorded, right? But I'm always fascinated by the fact that we feel very comfortable in, in, in our decisions because we think we understand them. And then you, even if you ask somebody, explain your decision here, it's not trivial sometimes to do so. And, and all the, the previous experience that you, you had in your life will influence that decision. And that, that is undisclosed information, right? And so sometimes this no, I feel this notion of interpretability is, is 
overweighted because as we as humans are not really interpretable. Like I, I, you know, anyway, especially politicians. You're gonna have to cut that part as well. Sorry. Um. So the last one of the last, I mean, the last hallmarks is about um, accessibility and, and transparency. And my lab is really, really focused on making things like we're big proponents of open science. We try to share the code, share the data, the documentation. And the reason is nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. And if you don't disclose those, nobody will ever find them. But also nobody will ever, will ever be able to build upon what you've done. I mean, I wouldn't love nothing more than taking somebody taking whatever model we predictors we built and say, oh, I can make it better. Do it, right? This is exactly what we do, why we do science. And so being fair so that your work, your work code and data is findable, accessible, interoperable. So you use kind of ontologies and dictionaries that are well documented uh, and reusable is, is very important. Um, and it's also a question of not only trust. I mean, I would rather trust a technology where I can dive into the details and understand what's going on, even if I, I don't have the, the expertise, but maybe somebody else can. You can audit the system, basically. But also in terms of return on investment, imagine those funders, they throw tons of money at your research, usually taxpayers' money. And if you don't disclose, then you made one group of people, like one lab, like maybe three people very happy for five years, if you're lucky. And that's about it. There is nothing like maybe you publish a paper. Maybe there is something in that paper that people found brilliant and, and be able to conceptually reuse. But if you share the data and the code, then the reusability is infinite. They can modify, adapt, and, 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 and everything. So I think in terms of return investment, it's very important to be uh, to embrace open science. And our AI, for instance, is a big, is a big problem because the complexity keeps increasing. So it gets harder and harder to understand what's going on. If you read uh, a, a AI paper, there is so much hyperparameters and, and complex architectural decisions in the model that if you don't have the code, there is no way that in that text, you're going to describe enough for you to reproduce. It's like me giving you a, a, a rough sketch of a car, say, oh yeah, four wheels, a body, something in between that make the, world, the, the, the wheels turning, but that's not there for you to build a car, right? And so we have a lot of technology. Sharing data is not an issue. We, we have a lot of repositories. We have ways to control access to the data if it's sensitive information. You can share your computer code uh, using a versioning system. You can share your whole software environment, these containers and, and whatnot. You can even share the computational model so that people don't have to train it. They can just use it. Um, and again, the analysis result of spreadsheets and figures, those are the easy stuff. And so if you share the raw data, the code for quality control, the, the process data, the code for model training, the, the, the model itself and how to run it, the software environment, even the checklist, like there are those checklists to make sure that you didn't miss. Oh, that's great that your study is like perfectly robust. In the lab, we try to do this. We fail 90% of the time. It's not easy. Right? It takes a lot of efforts to share everything, but we try as much as we can. But a lot of papers are just like that. They didn't share anything. It's just a piece of text telling you stuff that you're supposed to believe, right? And so in computational science and biomarker discovery, um, if you don't share the code and data, it's just honestly just kind of a, an advertisement. It's not really a, a scientific piece of work. So for the hallmarks, we've designed a few kind of, of those checklists to make sure that you, you've checked a few of those things, like is it fair? Uh, have you used the simple arch simplest architecture, stuff like that? And you can even have fun. If you read a paper, we, we, I mean, we only criticize our own paper. We don't want to upset anyone. But here is a paper from the lab. And it was a logical model, so very easy. So the data type was great because we could use only mutation or RNA stuff that could be used in the clinic. But the architecture was extremely limited. We could not build very complex formula. It was taking a lot of CPU time. So not, not a great score from an architecture perspective. The benchmarking, we did a decent job. We had a lot of sunlight data to, to do it. The generalizability, we didn't have a lot of clinical trial data, so we could do much better on that side. The fairness, we didn't even look at it, very bad. Interpretability, because those are logic formulas, like if you have this gene that's overexpressed and this gene that's lowly expressed and this interpretability, this is gonna happen. So super, super simple to understand. That was the whole point. 
and accessibility, we shared everything, but one library was a proprietary library from IBM. So it was kind of hard to access. So we didn't get a perfect score on that one. But that's that's kind of how you could use those hallmarks. You read a paper and you're wondering like, have they done all those things? And if not, it's probably gonna be not very useful for your own research. Um, so the take home points, um, so in terms of, of cancers, um, or oncology rather, biomarkers are really, really important to make sure that drugs are used to the right population of patients. Otherwise, it's gonna be a lot of, a lot of adverse side effects for nothing, a lot of money being spent for nothing. Um, there are multiple modalities you could use. Uh, we've seen many, many, uh, and the type of models you could use. Um, and when you build those biomarkers, those hallmarks kind of give you a bit of a map of what you should think when you build them. Um, and really the bottleneck today is that whatever you do, always think of the validation before. And a little bit what you were saying, Elena, about thinking of the, the clinical assay. Don't start a project if you don't know how to validate your biomarker. Because you may find something great, and if you're not able to validate it, you're not going to convince anybody that this is worth it, including yourself, right? And, and, and if you cannot convince somebody that it should be helpful for the patient, then it's never going to have really an impact. So try to, before you start a project, try to about, think about what kind of data should I collect? What kind of data do I need to actually make at least a good retrospective or even a prospective validation? And, and you basically kind of write it down on paper at the beginning of your, of your study. It's kind of a pre-registering, registration of your analysis design. And sure, you can deviate. Life is complicated, but at least you get a bit of a plan. And when you know that, if you do your work and you find a signal and you find this biomarker, whether it's a single feature, linear regression, deep neural network, then you keep that validation aside and at the very, very end, you say, okay, no, I really trust it. Let's test it. And if it works, then you think, then you can be sure that, sure, you can be very confident that you have something robust that potentially could be, could be useful in the clinic. With that, thank you for your attention. And if you have any further questions,